Okay, everyone, so we're now going to look at doing our translation between XML and JSON. And um, as I mentioned, we don't really need any special software for this. JSON and XML are both just text formats. Um, JSON, however, is less verbose, where in XML we have to name everything twice because we have to say name and then we have to say backslash name to end it. In JSON, we only have to name it once. Um, in using, we use caret braces usually for um, uh, in XML, always <laughs> we use caret braces in XML. Uh, we use curly braces in JSON, um, but we can actually get equivalent file for, uh, data structures out of um, either format. Um, so if you ever have to do that direct translation, it's useful. But it also just I think helps kind of illustrate um, really the connections among all of these different uh, kinds of you know among these different data formats, right? So so you don't think of them as being you know these really really different things. Um, they can actually be sort of translated. Uh, you know, back and forth as needed. Um, so we're going to start here with the top element. So in XML, it's always required that you have this sort of what's called the parent object, right? In this case, we can see it's called the response object. It doesn't really do much for us. It just says response code equals one. Um, JSON does away with that, and all it wants is curly braces. So again, JSON is going to want us to be symmetrical about um, the data structures that we create within it, but it's going to have less stuff in those symmetrical structures. So now we see something, um, the next element, right, which is we have this list of POIs, um, which we can see are all roughly the same. They're all wrapped in POI tags. And one thing about XML is it doesn't require you to explicitly specify whether an element is repeated. You can just repeat it. Um, and uh, XML parsers will figure out that it's a list, right, which is normally what we mean when we have repeated elements. Slight difference with JSON, you have to explicitly say that something is a list, and you do this by wrapping it in square brackets. Um, so when we get there, when we get to doing our points of interest, we're going to see that we wrap that part of it in square brackets. So at this point, though, I can just go here and I'm going to say, okay, so what was my element name co collection is essentially going to become my element name um, is actually going to become an element name in my JSON. Now, you can see the, the parallel here. I always have the name on the left, or the key on the left, is going to be wrapped in double quotations, and then a colon. Now, how do I indicate that this is an object, right? It's the, the an element is an object because it has uh, things inside of it, right? It has these attributes inside of it. The way that I indicate that in JSON is I say, oh, curly brace means that this is an object. So again, I'm creating my parallel structure here. I'm opening my curly brace and closing it. And then, inside, and then inside of that, I'm going to put the parts of my, uh, the, the pieces of my uh, element. So in this case, or my, sorry, my object. So my element becomes an object. So I see name equals POI. So I'm going to, I have to put the element on the left. I have to put the key in quotation marks in JSON. I don't have to do that in XML. But um, instead of an equal sign, I'm going to use a colon, and then I'm going to say POI. And you also notice that there's just a space between attributes. In JSON, this is going to be interpreted as a list, so I need to put those commas in there. And for some reason, I keep writing name instead of name. Um, and then I can just kind of go on down. I'm going to say, okay, count, right, as 22. Again, comma. Now, I'm going to cut this list short because we're obviously doing this just for demonstration purposes. Country um, is US. OK. Now, again, with a list, just as we would in an English sentence, we put commas between elements, uh, between items in a list, but we don't put a comma after the last item. So thus is my collection almost complete. I've, I've accounted for all of these things. But if we look again here, this collection element actually wraps all of our POI elements. And so how do we indicate inside of our collection element that actually we have a list? So our list, again, we're not going to, um, uh, the way that we indicate this list is we are going to say, sorry. <laughs> Um, is we're going to say, you know, here are, here's our POIs. So I'm going to say POI, and that is the name of the list, right? So here, every single point of interest says POI on it. Instead, I'm going to say POI is a list of objects. And I indicate a list by putting square braces around it. So rather than writing POI every time, I've just said, look, the name of this list is points of interest. 
Now I'm just going to give you the elements, the objects that make up those points of interest. So instead of having this wrapper top and bottom, I just have one declaration at the top that says this is a point of interest. So here I go. What's going to go in, uh, you know, my first, so I have to then, within that list, I have objects, right? So I have, a, uh, I need to show that it's an object by putting a set of curly braces. I know it seems like a lot of braces and not a lot of content right now. But the easiest way to do this is to do one and then copy that structure and change the information as needed. So what's the first, uh, what's the first part of my list? It is the name, okay? And in this case, copying and pasting is a great way to go here. Um, I am going to go ahead and do that. There we are. Put a comma after it. What's the next part of it? Is distance, right? Okay. I'm going to go ahead and say 1.3. You see they've got um, the unit on the distance, which is a good thing. Units are often the, the kind of thing that get left off of data sources. Um, distance unit of measure, I believe that stands for. Whoops, colon. Um, and it is mile, and let's go ahead and just put the ad street address in there. Um, we won't worry too much again about doing all of this. This is just to get the uh, the feel for it. So address, uh, 138 East 14th Street. I have been to that Trader Joe's, so I know that it's right. <laughs> um, anyway, so again, still we're in a list here. It's a list, so commas between, but not at the end. Now, that's one example. So what I can do is say, okay, well, that's every point of interest has that structure, so I'm just going to copy that structure. Again, putting commas between elements of the list, and in this case, I can go and say, oh, I should have included whether it sells beer, um, you know, and look at the next one. Okay, so Trader Joe's. Oh, that was the wine store, so this is the grocery store. Um, so now I can say, okay, well, what about? Now this is wrapped. I'm going to put this in there. Um, actually, this is going to have the same information because, of course, it's subpart, or no, it's not quite. It's 142. Okay, and we can go down here and make these um, and make these adjustments. So now the question is, how do we know if this is any good? <laughs> um, this can, you know, the the one of the things that's um, also valuable to understand about XML um, and JSON, as opposed to uh, for example, things like spreadsheets, right, where we saw that sometimes you have a tab uh, character as a delimiter, <clears throat> sometimes you have a space as a delimiter, things that are punctuation, so we would have to be careful with our white space. One thing that's nice about these formats is, and we of course have a lovely format on the left here because um, the, the browsers have been designed to render them nicely, um, is that white space is not what we would call significant. In other words, anything that is not curly brace, a square brace, a colon, a comma, or wrapped in quotation marks is going to be ignored. Um, and what that means too is that we can also kind of use, uh, use formatters to make it easier to read. Now, in order to understand if this is um, correct or not, right, if this would actually be digestible by, um, as a data source, um, fortunately there is a resource on the web called JSON Lint. I'm going to go ahead and open that up right now. Got a Firefox window just so I have full screen. So I've copied my um, thing in here. And so I go to jasonlint.com. I'm going to paste this in and click validate. And one thing that it does, one of the very nice things it does besides tell me if it's correct or not, is it gives me this very lovely format that helps me understand the structure. So now it's really easy for me to see that, okay, I have this, this main collection element and it has these attributes, name, count, and country, and then there's a list of points of interest and each of those has a name, a distance, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So again, we haven't gone through the entire thing, but hopefully this is enough to provide you with an idea of how you might do this kind of conversion and really just more than that, just the relationship between these two data formats so that you understand that if you have one, you can get the other, or you can make use of it in a similar way. Now, I do want to point out that when you are working with these data formats, you must be extremely meticulous. Computers are stupid, right? If we read a, if we read a sentence, you know, and there's a missing comma or there's an extra comma, usually it might take a, two or three reads sometimes, depending on, this, on the structure, um, but usually we as humans can figure out what it means. Computers have no such facility, which means that if I, for example, forget one comma, all of a sudden there's a problem. Now, the other thing is that computers are also really poor at communicating with humans, um, which is why instead of saying something useful like you're missing a comma, um, it says parse error on line five. Um, and what it's 
pointing out, and you can see how it's actually shifted the formatting. It said, well, look, you've got, because there's no comma, it's seeing uh, two, two key value pairs and no separator, no delimiter there, actually. Um, and so it's getting confused. Now, the most valuable thing that it's going to tell you is what line it's on, right, which I can see through these handy line numbers, so I have an idea of where to start. And then it says, I'm expecting one of these things, possibly, which is often less useful because it's expecting pretty much anything that could be a delimiter, and sometimes it takes some effort to figure out what it is. But if I put my comma back in here, I see that it validates just fine. So. Um, that kind of should hopefully give you an overview, help you understand that, yes, there are a lot of data formats out there. They do have different strengths and weaknesses. One thing that we looked at just briefly earlier on, of course, was PDFs. Um, PDFs in general are really not awesome for the work that we want to do. Um, you know, if you want to publish something and really preserve its formatting, it's good, but for doing data analysis, it's, it's poor. So uh, keep in mind that when you are working with data sources, you want to look for the most flexible formats available. Again, because things like comma separated value, JSON, um, you know, .txt, TSV, all of these things are uh, non-proprietary, open, basic text formats. If this data exists, you should be able to get it in one of those formats. Um, and then you can use these tools and skills to convert it into something that is usable for your needs. Um, so that's uh, that's a sort of basic introduction. We'll be going over all of this in class, of course. Um, and hopefully this has kind of given you an idea of uh, some of what's possible with the variety of software and data formats that are out there. And um, we'll provide a few more examples in class um, of different specifications that are equally uh, open source and valuable. Um, and uh, I look forward to seeing all of you next week.